Hey, welcome everyone to another session of Experience Week. Um, this is super exciting because we're talking about product experience today. I'm Ryan Smith, co-founder and CEO of Qualtrics, and I have the pleasure of sitting down with Stuart Butterfield, founder and CEO of Slack. How are you, Stuart? I am well, thank you. First, before we get started, Stuart, talk, let's talk about where Slack came from, how you came up with the idea. This isn't your first rodeo. You created a, a well-known product called Flickr. Mm -hmm. Very few entrepreneurs can do it once, let alone twice. So if you just take us through the origin of you know, Flickr and then, and then Slack and, and why we're here. All right, well, so the bad news is that um, they're close to impossible to replicate. Both are kind of uh, pivots from failed massively multiplayer games. So it's the kind of thing that I think if you started off with the intent to build a failed massively multiplayer game, you may not end up with, with a product like this. But um, there's something common to both of those failed games, Flickr and Slack. And that comes from um, an experience I had 25 years ago, so it's 1992. Um, it's my first year of college. One of the things we had to do was go down to the basement computer lab in the Clara Hugh building at the University of Victoria and get our accounts on the school's Unix machine. So I got that, and this is a couple years before the web, uh, or maybe a year and a half before the web really took off. So the things on the internet were Usenet, Talk, IRC, email, and I could use email to talk to to friends who had gone off to different colleges. Um, but Usenet kind of just blew my mind, this directory of uh, newsgroup topics, kind of like a bulletin board. And this was like 90% of the traffic on the internet in the days before the web. In fact, rec.music.gdead, or the Grateful Dead um, <laughs> discussion group was like the Netflix of its time. It was like 40% of, of internet traffic. And the thing that was so exciting to me was the use of computing technology to facilitate human interaction, which was kind of really brand new. Uh, that you could transcend geography, that you could, could you know, transcend um, the the way in which you grew up and find these people who could be in different time zones on different continents but shared the same interests as you. So it might not seem connected, um, but uh, over the next couple of years, when the web came to prominence, I taught myself HTML, I got a job as a web designer. In the first days of blogging, I was really avid, you know, maybe from 99 through 2002 or something like that. And all of this early um, online community, the kind of birth of social software, you know, now we're at the point where everyone has these fancy phones in their pocket. You can communicate with anyone on the surface of the planet, literally at the speed of light. And what are we going to do with that technology? So we, as a again, as a species, kind of stumbling our way, trying different things, experimenting. But I think we're still in the really early stages. So when I say we wanted to try and make a game, I think what people think is like, or like a guy with a sword fighting a dragon or something like that. This was much more taking those early virtual communities and putting them into the context of play. Really collaborative, um, a lot of social interaction, one world that was shared, and the point of the game was kind of to evolve the world. There's a book by the theologian James Carse called Finite and Infinite Games. And the first line of the book, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but there are two kinds of games. One is played for the purpose of winning. Um, those are finite games. And then infinite games, which are played for the purpose of continuing the play. So that was really our inspiration. Turns out, a little bit hard to explain, a little bit lofty, not super commercially viable. Um, so especially in 2002, which is when we started the first company, you sure you know you remember this time, we had the dot-com crash, we had WorldCom and Enron, the big accounting scandals, 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just like a disaster moment, kind of black economy. Um, the NASDAQ had fallen 80% from its peak, and no one wanted to fund a, anything on the internet at all, but especially not something whimsical like a game. And we were looking for something that we could get to market quicker, because the game was really complex and ambitious, but that would take advantage of the technology we'd already developed. That turned out to be Flickr. It's kind of a whole story there, which we can gloss over. Um, Flickr got bought by Yahoo in 2005. Myself um, and the whole team went to go work there. And then uh, 2009, at the beginning of the year, I was out, um, and three of those original Flickr team members still at Yahoo, we all decided to leave and to start a new company to build a web-based massively multiplayer game. This time we couldn't fail. Technology had advanced. Servers were really cheap compared to 2002. Way more people online. We were all better at what we did. There's all this great open source software. Um, the network had spread you know, from a couple people having dial-up at home to more or less ubiquitous broadband and uh, failed again. But 
we spent three and a half years on it, and we had a really dis a cross disciplinary team. We had um, creative people, artists, animators, writers, musicians on the one hand, and then we had more traditional software development team, back end programming, technical operations. We had um, customer support, business operations, and we used one of those technologies that I first discovered back in 1992, IRC, or Internet Relay Chat, as the foundation for how we communicated at the company. And IRC has this one fundamental concept called a channel, and you send messages to the channel rather than to individuals or to groups of individuals as you do in email or most messaging systems. And that's a, it's a fundamental shift because the channel can exist before you arrive and it can exist after you leave. You can look into other channels across the system. Um, when you join the organization, you know, whether it's the next day or six months later or five years later, all of that stuff is archived in all, in all these different channels. And we slowly, over the course of years, built feature after feature, solved the really irritating problems, took advantage of the obvious opportunities. And so fast forward now to 2012, end of the year, it was apparent that the game wasn't going to work. Like, it just wasn't going to be viable again. It was never going to be the kind of business that would justify the 17 million bucks of venture capital investment we had raised. Uh, but we all realized we would never work without a system like this one again. And so thought that it might be something that the rest of the world would want. And I still remember going to Andreessen Horowitz, one of our investors, and telling them this is what we we're going to do and saying, you know, we think that there's a big market for this. We think over the next 10 years, that kind of at the fullness of time, this could be $100 million in revenue. This could be a billion dollar company. And it, I'm sure they remembered this differently, but we're like, whatever. And uh, we blew past that a couple of years after launching. So uh, the demand has been much bigger than we would have thought. And I think we've sort of accidentally discovered something that is there's for which there's a lot of latent demand. No, it's really cool. It's a fascinating story. And I think it's one that a lot of people can can uh, relate to just from how something great comes out of a pivot. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think it takes a lot, of, a lot of guts and kind of willpower to be able to do that. As you think about where Slack is today, what's, what's most exciting from, you know, just for our audience to see the size and, you know, how do you, how do you, yeah, how do you talk so, about that? Yeah, um, so there are uh, over 6 million daily active users, 9 million on a weekly basis, um, a little bit more than half, 55% of those are outside of the U.S., there's 50,000 um, paid teams around the world. You have millions of people paying for it. But when we say daily active user, you mean like you know people are logging in there every day because it's the kind of app that you you can't just check in on you know once in a while. If you're not using it every day, you're not really using mm -hmm. it. And when we think about the future, obviously there's just more. Like there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who fall into the kind of sweet spot of knowledge work, um, and they could be you know, speaking English or some other language. They could work in IT or legal or recruiting or finance or tech, um, marketing, um, and we barely scratch the surface there. You know, we're like over a couple percent of the way in. And then the, the, the second thing, Slack tends to replace the usage of uh, email for internal communication. It definitely doesn't, you know, it's not an email killer. It doesn't get rid of email across organizational boundaries. But when people hear that, I think the, what comes to mind is you type some text into a box, you hit the button, and then it gets sent over the internet and someone else can look at it. But that's not all we use email for. Like email is this system of record, it's our to-do list, it's the fundamental kind of security passport you can use to reset your password everywhere else. It's the way that you get receipts for all your transactions. You take a ride in a lift or you Buy something on Amazon, that's where your receipt shows up. It's friends and family, it's invitations to events, it's unwelcome pitches from salespeople, it's welcome pitches from salespeople, it's newsletters you subscribe to, marketing messages, spam. Um, but inside of a company, really specifically, it's the way all decisions get made. It's like the way the job offer gets approved, or the budget is debated on, um, set in direction for the company, all the formal announcements. Um, you know, we just hired a new executive, or we bought a company, or we're shutting down this division, or whatever. And all of that stuff moves to Slack, including all of the critical workflows, you know, which can be things as mundane as approving expense reports um, or putting in a ticket to IT for support because your laptop's messed up, um, all the way up to approving the contract for your biggest customer ever. Yeah, I think, um, look, we've definitely seen that at Qualtrics where um, you know, it's, it's prevalent throughout all our organizations, especially in engineering. Um, as, we, as, we, as we shift a little bit and talk about product itself, mm -hmm. 
Um, you've had a lot of um, iterations. I think the virality or the viral component of Slack's been super impressive to a lot of people. When you, when you think about creative and product, and you think about hiring, uh, how, do you, how do you actually think about those together? I just came in on the, on the wall, I saw empathy and creative. Um, mm. how, how does that all play out? I've heard you talk about it before. There's um, uh, a saying from Charles Eames, architect and designer, uh, that the role of designer is that of a good host. That way of thinking that you know the people using your product are your guests is puts you in a very different mindset than you're like this creative genius and what you're doing is super important and the world just doesn't understand you um, and people should appreciate this because we have really just a uh, 180 degree different attitude when we evaluate our own stuff versus when we use other people's software or experience other people's products. And it's like this thing where when you go to a restaurant website, if you're anything like me, you want the phone number the address, the opening times, or the menu. And nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. And yet, no one makes restaurant websites that prioritize that stuff. It's like this stupid music starts playing and there's like a slow Ken Burns pan over some pasta <laughs> or whatever, and you have to wait for that to be done. No one wants that experience for themselves, and yet they feel like other people are going to want it. Uh, and that's a, kind of the most exaggerated example I can find. But... We really try to put ourselves in the position of our customers, and you, you can try different techniques for that. One that I'm, I'm not sure if it's truly effective or not, but I've tried a lot with people, is just to try to imagine someone's heard about Slack a couple times, maybe they saw a tweet about it, um, they saw an ad that we put up, and then someone recommended again. It's the end of their day, it's 9 p.m., they just put the kids to bed, they're watching TV, they lay back, they go to the app store, and they install our app, and we are just like, not even in the top 1,000 most important things in their lives. You know, like they have all these other concerns, ambitions, issues, and we don't want to um, create an experience that is anything less than the most respectful it could be of their time. Imagine if you were designing this for yourself, you don't care about the company at all, just purely selfishly, how would this work? You know, how would you be onboarded into the app? How would the administrative features work? How would you invite people? How would you install applications into Slack from our app directory? It's a tough one. For, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, a lot of people have been trained up on <sighs> techniques for like value extraction from customers as opposed to value creation for customers. And you know, we are a business and we want to make money. Uh, but I really admire... Um, and there could definitely be some survivorship bias here, but companies like Amazon, where you're know, like, we had 20 plus year focus. Um, they're now 20 something years old. They started making money a couple of years ago. And up to that point, it was just creation of value. And they're still relentlessly focused on how fast can the delivery happen? How fast can the pages load? How fast can and accurate can the search results be? Um, and those fundamentals are, are really critical. And it's harder and harder. Um, to ensure that our focus remains on those as we get bigger and as we get more customers, we get more demands from customers, more feature requests, um, more input of just of all kinds. And, and we, almost as a point of religion, try to keep ourselves as open to feedback as possible. So expose as much of the company to like surface area of customers as, as we can. Um, so I don't know, like I have no one magic trick there except for, again, focusing on that experience and imagining that this person using the software is is our guest. They are more important than us. We're trying to be of service to them. And if we can truly create value, there'll be plenty of opportunities for us to capture some of that down the road. So most, most people probably watching this um, are either with a really small company where it's really easy to be involved in all the details. And we've actually had this conversation before. I remember yeah. a couple of years ago, you and I were talking about being involved in all the details on the product side. Um, but you just mentioned Amazon, mm -hmm. where as you get bigger and the challenges that we've gone through, that you've gone through of scaling, how do you make sure that you don't have product drift, right? Yeah. Or something that, something that ends up different than you thought? I don't think many people set out and say, hey, we want to build a, a product with a horrible experience, but mm -hmm. here we are surrounded by products that have a horrible experience. So yeah. what are, what's, what's a couple tips that you have for creating that and, and maintaining that focus? I think it's really remembering how much deliberate effort it takes, and that can like literally be putting things on the wall. So you saw something on the wall here, but you know it's checklist techniques. It's like here's the mantra we repeat at the beginning of the meetings weekly, or whatever it is, to keep that foreground. Because uh, when new people start at Slack, I tell them this story. 
I'm in Vancouver, we have an office there. I'm meeting with our creative director for product design. We're having a one-on-one. -on -one. We're in this neighborhood in Vancouver where the sidewalks are really narrow and there's uh, a lot of vendors have sandwich boards out on the sidewalks. So you kind of got to go like this when you're walking down and it starts to rain. And we don't have umbrellas, but you know, most other people do, maybe three quarters or something like that. And when people are walking towards us, we notice that very few of them move their umbrellas out of the way. So, you know, it's like the pokey things, right? Are at like eye level when we're walking down the street. And it became kind of a joke we were talking about it. And we're trying to predict like the next person, would they move it out of the way or not? And they didn't. So one explanation, and this is not the correct explanation because you should not attribute to malice what can be explained by ignorance. So one explanation is like, these people don't have many avenues to exercise power in their life. And so they're just like, I'm gonna make you get out of the way of my umbrella. That's probably not it. But what explanations remain? So like one is they just don't notice. They're walking down the street, despite the fact that they would inevitably, living in any city like Vancouver, have had this experience themselves before where they didn't have the umbrella and someone else did. They just don't see it. Or they see it and they're like, I can't, I don't know what I could do about this. It's too bad that that's happening and that that person has to get out of the way of my umbrella, but I, you know, I don't have any theories about what I could do to make that situation better. When it's really like, there's two options. One is this. You know, like a hundredth of a calorie worth of effort in one little tiny muscle in your wrist. And the other one is this. Like, those two things will get the umbrella out of the way. And I don't like thinking about the world this way because it's a little bit of a pessimistic view. But most people didn't move their umbrellas out of the way. So most people just don't see the problems. Or if they see the problems, they don't see a solution to the problems. Um, and it's not like there's one class of humans who are geniuses and we'll see it every time and then there's a bunch of morons and we wanna make sure we only hire the geniuses. We all have that tendency, we all have that continuum, we all have a focus on ourselves and our own priorities and our own needs. Yeah, when you, you mentioned something earlier around, and it seems like there's a repetitiveness that has to go on to educate everyone around you know, what we're focused on and kind of the, the, the principles of great product, great design. Um, you mentioned being a host, mm -hmm. right? What what makes a good host in your mind? If you're if you're hosting the product and you you actually view it as you're a steward over that experience, mm -hmm. what what makes that? I mean, um, I think it's it's pretty simple. It doesn't mean that getting the result is simple, but the the orientation is pretty simple, which is thoughtfulness, anticipating needs. You know, one of my favorite examples of literally being a host is if you have someone come in to stay at your house, some, some guests, and you have a guest room, take the towels that you want them to use and put them on the bed, you know, nicely folded. So when they come in, they're like, oh, I should use those towels rather than going to the bathroom and be like, there's a whole bunch of towels in here. I'm not sure which ones I'm supposed to use. And it might sound like a stupid example, um, but again, it's incredibly little effort and it anticipates that need. And anyone who has ever been to a good restaurant, and not necessarily like a fancy, expensive restaurant, but just one where it, it's well run, it can be like a little family joint, there's this thoughtfulness that goes into greeting you at the door, how you get to the table. You know, like there's a very, there's a big difference between the abrupt, please wait to be seated, and then kind of like yeah. a mean host or hostess, um, and the kind of welcoming. And a huge amount of thoughtfulness that goes into the presentation on the menu. Like there's a lot of places that use light gray text on white paper that's tiny and then it's dark in the restaurant and you see people pull out their phones. So anytime you see someone pull out their phone in a restaurant, like there was a failure of thoughtfulness on the part of the restaurateur. But also the noise levels, um, how responsive the, the servers are. Like there's this great experience where you never feel like you're being pestered and yet anytime you want something, they're right there. Like, you know, if you want your water's empty, they're there refilling it. When you're ready to have the plates taken away, they're taken away. When you're ready for the bill, the bill just magically shows up. None of those require like, you know, a $500 tasting menu at a three-star Michelin restaurant. So um, it's a lot of the same things for us. So we will produce it. And, and um, you know, I absolutely myself have been guilty of this. I spent decades as a designer for a living of this looks cool when I like step back and look at it. But boy, that text is actually super hard to read. You know, like there's like important explanatory text that's right underneath it. Or um, here's an example recently just from Slack. So when you create a channel, the channel name, and this is changing soon, but for now anyway, it has to be lowercase letters. We had a field in the iOS app that capitalized the first letter of your word. So we would, you would type a lowercase letter, we would capitalize it, you would finish typing the thing, you would hit enter, and then we would tell you, uh-uh-uh, no uppercase letters allowed. Um, and that's like a, just such an incredible example of 
uh, not something that anyone would have prioritized in the creation of this dialog box. You know, like we've got a requirement that we're going to do work on this feature. It's that kind of oversight. So a lot of it is just running through the experience yourself and really, again, putting that effort in to put yourself in the position of someone who doesn't know this stuff, doesn't care about it, doesn't have the same set of priorities you do. They don't work for Slack. They're not interested in whether we're successful or not other than, you know, they're a customer and they would like us to continue to exist. Um, what do they want? What, are, what experience are they looking for? And it's 9 p.m. and they just put the kids down, right? Yeah, exactly. And they're, <laughs> you know, and when they think about, like, we're, we're, Thinking about the future of work, and we got all kinds of amazing visions, and we're in this hundred-year transformation, and we're starting to really understand how to make use of all this um, technology to to work better. And kind of, you know, it's a messy process now. And meanwhile, for them, it's like I'm mad at this person because they got a promotion I didn't, and I'm like annoyed with my spouse because they said that they were going to go pick up stuff from the store and they didn't do it, and just like you know, all the things that are going on in in their life. Like I said, we're we're not even in the top thousand of their concerns. When you think about hiring a host, mm -hmm. right? A product host, or what? What are the? What do you look for? And I mean, and, and yeah, we talked earlier about how. And no one's right all of the time. It's a tough one. You know, like there's a couple of things that for me are, are showstoppers, and one of them would be the kind of person who is rude to the receptionist or rude to the server in the restaurant, rude to the security guard on the way in, I think is just not going to have the, the ability to put other people first. You know, mm. it's like that's just kind of like it's three strikes in one action for me. It's hygiene uh, issues, right? <laughs> yeah. Like and there's some people who are just strangely dismissive. Uh, um, you know, they, they, unless someone's important to them and, and it's going to be valuable for them for some reason, they're just jerks. Um, so, you know, there's an obvious one. The rest of them are a lot more subtle. Uh, one positive marker is curiosity and an open mind. It's an indicator for me of, of a couple of qualities that are positive. So, um, you know, proactiveness, I think, is one of them. Intelligence is another. But I think curiosity is, is important in its own right. Like, it's just, it's a stance towards the world, which is like, I like to learn. I'm, you know, I have theories. I'm excited to test them out. And I want to understand how things work. And, and if you have that orientation, I think you're much more likely to be successful. So as you think about, here you are, you've got a great host, you've got a great product, you're in a bigger company or a little company, and you're, you're doing well. You're actually able to drive change. Mm -hmm. Are you leading, and this is the question we always get into around the product, are you leading ahead of what the customer wants? Are you responsive to what they want? Are you creating something that they've never seen before? Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your take on this? Because I think you know, you've got this great vision around communication, and I think everyone's starting to see it, but I don't think everyone saw no, even yourself, what yeah, Anderson, Andreessen yeah. Horowitz was saying. Yeah, we didn't. We definitely. I mean, like, we really thought that as the biggest we could ever get was like how big we got about eighteen months ago, um, and that was definitely wrong. And now the sites are set much higher, and we think that there are, you know, like literally hundreds of millions of people who will be using Slack or something like it within the next decade. And for now, at least, we're number one. I'll knock on this little wood here thing. I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't appear like it's contradictory, so we'll see if it's if it's yeah. a contradiction. But um, by, the, the, first by the way, this question is contradictory. I yeah. mean, it's very hard. It's like how far do you lead your customers, right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's, it's so hard. it's definitely it's a call and response kind of thing, and it's um, it requires paying deep attention. But I think of it a little bit more like a performer on stage, like a magician or a musician or whatever feeding off the audience, reacting to them, like having an understanding of their cues, but not when someone holds up their lighter and says Freebird, instantly stopping the song that you're playing and starting to play Freebird. Maybe you don't play Freebird all night, yeah. you know? Um, and um, you're responsible for, for their entertainment, um, and you don't just do exactly what they want you to do. You're trying to, to create for their benefit. But if you don't pay any attention to them at all, you know, like if you're trying to do stand-up comedy and you just have no sense of the room, you're gonna bomb for sure. I think we tend to look for the intent behind what customers are asking rather than the specific implementation. Because usually the, the implementation that they're requesting, the feature that they're requesting or the change in the product is really driven by what they see today and it's, it's reacting to that rather than kind of what the higher goal is. And what the higher goal is for any executive, any manager is gonna be, we want to increase alignment, we wanna break down silos, we wanna make sure everyone's coordinated on the same page, pushing in the same direction. And what's interesting is the 
the non-executive, non-manager, the workers inside the organization actually want exactly the same thing. Right? You think about Office Space, the movie, or the TV show The Office, or like Dilbert, or anything, any of those tropes of office life and the disenfranchisement that people feel or alienation, it's really, I don't feel like I understand the context for these decisions. Nothing makes any sense. I'm not in the loop. I don't understand what these other groups are doing. They, these both seem to be working on the same project, but it's redundant. And that overlap and the kind of like the Venn diagram of, of what the end users, let's say, inside the organization want and what the leaders want is exactly the sweet spot that, that Slack tries to drive towards. Yeah, it's interesting uh, the way you explained it around, you know, if you're an artist and you're on stage and how your, your, your job's really to give them a show, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's, and they're obviously there, Yeah. right? So I'm, I'm, the reason I said it was like contradictory is because I'm just saying that you're trying to, you know, be the host and not, you're not the rock star. Um, but, and if I can come up with a better, or if you can come up with a better analogy there, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But there is, you know, the, the key point there is paying attention to them and having to read for it and understanding their reactions and be able to, you know, if you are a good magician, it's all about misdirection and where people are paying attention. So if you don't have a really good sense of what people are, are thinking about, then you're going to fail. And I think it's the same thing in, in software. Like, you really have to but pay attention. Last question is, if we think about um, creative, right? You were a designer. Um, I think one of the challenges, you know, I run creative teams. We, every organization does it differently. How, how do you think about where creative plays in the role of product and engineering? I think there's a, cause so many different ways I can answer this, but the one that, because the last word you said was engineering, that you know that got me thinking was um, the interplay between product and engineering. Because you can, in poorly functioning organizations, you can be like, here's what we want to do, and then the response can be, that's impossible, or that's too expensive, or it's too hard, or it won't work because of, of whatever. Um, and even if that's the first response, the in a well-functioning product development organization, both sides get creative in that. Okay, so that that's too expensive, that's going to take too long, or that's too complicated, or that's not going to work, or it's impossible. What about if we did it this way? Well, hey, I guess if we did it this way, then we could do this. And there's this kind of negotiation, and you know, uh, in, you can think about it in one sense, like two parties who are in opposition negotiating to some kind of consensus which is in the middle. Or in the best case, it's kind of like Lennon and McCartney or Jagger and Richards or something like that. Like there's an actual interplay and we're pushing in this direction, we're pushing in this direction and we, um, it's multiplicative. Like we actually accentuate each other's strengths and drive to whatever the best solution is. So that's definitely the idea. Don't, not realized every day, but uh, that's the game. Well, and it's typically after the, you know, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth iteration that you actually come upon something great. And I think if that doesn't exist, then you're always going with the first or the second. You don't ever actually do anything. Yeah, it's like the, uh, I'm trying to remember what exactly what it was, but the first version of uh, Yesterday, that song, mm -hmm. is like scrambled eggs. Because scrambled eggs are broccoli or something yeah, like yeah, that. Because yeah. like, you're trying to think of what the lyrics would be. Um, that that's good that that version didn't get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, um, it's a true pleasure. I think we're all watching the growth, and um, we're excited to see uh, this whole vision play out. And I think it's an exciting time. So thanks for thanks for all your help. Yeah, great to talk to you. All right.